Good day, Thicketeers. I'm Alistair Potts, and we're trying something a little bit new. Uh, we haven't done this before, but to try and ha have an, a general discussion with a farmer, and we want to see if we can roll out for, for future years to have kind of informal interviews with landowners and, and stakeholders uh, that are involved with Thicket. And so today I have the privilege of uh, having a discussion with Arthur Rudman. And Arthur is a, a farmer in the Eastern Valley Bushveld thicket. He's been farming here for more than 60 years and he's been farming uh, primarily with goats. And so what I'd, I'd like to chat about is that in my experiences from a researcher side of things is that I read in the literature and we have this kind of discussion and conservation circles about thicket degradation and we kind of hold up the goat as the kind of like evil uh, i've heard it termed like white cancer for thicket that just kind of goes and eats up all of that landscape and uh, arthur reached out to me and said hang on you know your ideas are you, you've made way too many assumptions here and you need to actually understand the history of what's what's going on and it's been an absolutely like fascinating thing to try and rethink the history of thicket degradation so arthur thank you very much for your time and sharing with us your knowledge of the landscape of the kind of socio-economic drivers in this landscape and i think Firstly, uh, I'd like to just start off by asking your history. Uh, how have you gotten to this point where you are now? Yes, Alistair, you're most welcome. Nice to have you with us over here. You know, there isn't enough communication between the academics and the bureaucratic area, as well as the farmer, which has the obviously the, the experience and uh, from my point of view that uh, I've been on, on the farm all my life. I'm 76 years old now. I started farming here when I was 18 years old after matriculating, etc. So I've participated quite substantially in, in, and, and heavily involved with organized agriculture for many, many years. And it was a learning curve initially you know, when you're in your early 20s, it's more sport and friends, etc. And then later on, when you get into the mid-20s and 30s and 40s, when you're in a branch out and build up your own farming system. Unfortunately, I was able to do that on our parents' farm initially. You know, the, the, this is now with my sons on the farm. That's the fourth generation of farmers that we have at Blokrans. Uh, we and and to combat the 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 loss of opportunities and also that you have the inflation rate to cut your inflation rate uh, and to overcome the inflation you have to grow and 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 if you don't grow you're going to die on a farm so with the result is that you have to increase your size and grow the whole time so that's what we've done at Blokrans, and because of that i was able to introduce my my sons and my daughter into the farming system with their families as well so we're all on the farm here now but it took the risk factor that you had to increase the size of your properties and then with size you can manipulate and work your various flocks and your systems your farming systems with the necessary fencing etc so it's very important that you grow because you'll find that with the subdivisions that they had made initially the British government in this particular southern part of the East Cape Valley Bushveld the British government then introduced a land surveyor a Mr. Hoole and he's, he divided the area so that the, the area can be populated. What, what uh, decade are we talking about there? 1888 1890 that was the period and um, then the British government gave Mr. Hool the option of whatever farms he had sub that he had divided there were about six to seven thousand hectares at that particular say those were Morgan those days 
100 yards by 100 yards today, hectares 100 meters by 100 meters. And uh, then they gave him the, the option and offer that he could buy one of those properties. And all he had to do was to pay for whatever the British government paid him uh, to subdivide, uh, to have it populated the area. And he, he chose Blokrans, but then after a year or two, he subdivided that again. So, you know, one can own many title deeds or farms, but they could be all subdivisions and small. And unfortunately, these subdivisions of those six, seven thousand, eight hundred thousand hectares were then subdivided into two, three hundred hectare properties. And that is, whoever came to farm and buy those little small sections there, uh, it's a survival, survival. And because they had to survive, they never had the the facilities those days because there wasn't any fencing. And when the fencing did come about, it was more for convenient. Every flock had a camp. So just continual grazing as if there wasn't any fencing anyway, from the vegetation point of view. So the result is that the, 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 the vegetation was denuded with the belief of the farmers that the droughts were prevalent at that particular stage, or at all stages. We're in a low rainfall area of it, between 250 and 320 uh, millimeters a year. So you always have drought because we're in between the summer and the winter rainfall areas. Well, the result is that uh, they always believed that when the copious rains arrive and we have the floods and so forth, that everything will be restored again to what it was initially. So if they did damage the vegetation, the bush, it would recover, but it never. That, it was unknown, obviously, at that stage, so it never did recover. There was no advice, no, I'm talking about the years now when this took place was, say, from 1910 to 1950 on. Uh, those were the damaging years. So those 50 years that it took, it'll take another 50 years if we have to restore this vegetation to something similar by planting speckworm and doing it correctly and protecting it correctly, it will probably take 50 years to restore, but it can be done, fortunately. So can I ask you, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating thing about where this idea of that, you know, once the rains return, that the that valley bush felt and the thicket will just bounce back. I have a suspicion that it comes from because most of the farming, at least in the east of South Africa, is grassland and savanna where the cycles are much shorter and the response times are much shorter so when there are droughts the vegetation disappears when the drought breaks the vegetation returns rapidly do you think it might have had to do with that kind of eastern mindset eastern south african grassland mindset or, or do you think there might have been another driver behind behind that now i think you're quite correct you had you had the grass felt areas and then you also had uh, the karoo now the karoo, it anchors itself, a karoo plant anchors itself, and it's a very tough one. So when the rains do come again, they do recover, because the root system is still in. Now the grass felt is something similar, and then you had uh, the ACOC system and Tainton system, they were all quick rotations, and, and um, short rest, but quick rotations so you don't damage the plant. And then you give it one a growing period. Now the bush knew, nobody knew. So it, uh, I, I remember collect, recollect so much so in the 19, late 60s and early 70s, I was actually secretary of a soil conservation committee. And we had an exceptionally good committee in the sense that you had the department on the one side and you had the farmers on the other side from local level. You had an extension officer, then you had your provincial, and then you had your national bodies, they're all interlinked with the department and uh, learned people in the department, by the way. And then you had the farmers on the other side that were realizing that something must be done. And it was, in fact, just to use it as an example, there's one farm here in the 1950 that had 18 boar goats on one Morgan. And the department said, no, that's wrong, it should only be nine. But when we came together in 1970, that was devised on that particular same property, 
that you must have three hectares per one goat. And, and obviously nobody knew exactly what the carrying capacity was until we all sat down and we, and we worked that. And each one of us on that particular committee had, to, had certain areas that he was to control and used to send the word out of what rotational grazing should be and what the carrying capacity should be and changing the farming systems. So, yeah, I suppose one of the things is that we've had a long history of agricultural education. And but I, I think you mentioned to me earlier when, when we were discussing this, that you couldn't go anywhere to learn about thicket. It was all about grasslands and savannas and, and, and also Karoo, uh, potentially Karoo farming. So potentially one of the, the, the issues has been that we've been conflating the, the thicket with these other systems and thinking and thinking and respond to respond that way. Thanks. I, I think that's a that's a great in, introduction. I was wondering, you know, it would be fascinating to discuss the kind of history and innovations that have happened in farming and m maybe a history of the landscape, because you've put a lot of effort into understanding the histories of these landscapes. Uh, so the, the question is, yeah. Can we look at the history of this landscape and how farming has unfolded in, in this landscape? So we've spoken about 1890, where the surveys have come in and they've, they've parceled up land. What are the kind of major events that have uh, happened uh, since then? You know, we mentioned earlier on about goats, and I've heard it quite often from urban fellows about the goats and then they are blaming the goats the goats is it's not the goat it is the the management of the goats so it is the land owner he was at fault due to lack of knowledge it is a new concept here nobody really knew what the carrying capacity is and because speckworm can become palatable just after the rain the people were, were watching the animals and, and not the plant as much. Bearing in mind that, um, let's go to history. We had the Rinderpest in 1897 that decimated animals from East Africa, from Kenya. The entry was right down here. In fact, they're still saying that the Anglo-Boer War was started because of the Rinderpest. It was the thieving of animals amongst each other. So. If you take the 50 years from 1897 to plus minus 1945, 1950, it is a very traumatic period. There wasn't that amount of funds available at all uh, to start up. The government never had funds. The areas that had to be populated as what it was in, in, this, in, in the Valley, East Cape Valley Bushveld, there weren't funds available. So they they used branches of, of they, they had herdsmen and they had, as we call it tack rules those days and they animals used to come and sleep at night in the crawls every crawl every night because of predators and control so and and then later on the boundary fences were only cattle proof boundary fences where your goats would get through and because the, Oh, sorry, when was that? The, when, we're talking that about we're talking fencing? about then from about 19, 1910. The properties were land surveyed in eighteen eighty odd to eighteen ninety odd, and then slowly the farmers came in. But the, one of the the biggest problems that we had in the southern side of the Eastern Cape was that the hot water tick was the damaging tick that killed goats and killed any form of sheep. But the many of the game species were immune. Springback used to die, die, and they still die of hot water. Your deer, which is an exotic animal, that dies of hot water. And and many of your species, your grass grazers that you find in the colder areas, grass field areas. But when you get along the coast, then you, then uh, those particular animals like your browsers, they are immune to hot water. So because your goats and your sheep and your cattle died of hot water and red water, that this 
the areas down in the south were actually spared from being grazed due to the unknown factor of how to graze. But unfortunately, there wasn't enough funds available for facilities. If you have what we have today, in that you have the knowledge from what we had planned and what you have through universities, as yourself, Alistair, as an educated person and in, involved with animals and veg uh, vegetation more than botany. So resulting in that, all that combination, and we never had any university over here or college to, to look after the East Cape Valley bushville. That was an unknown factor. And everybody ran away from it because they said it was unhealthy. And it was until the dips were able to control your ticks and those dips basically was about the 1940s. Uh, prior to that, the people used to, to cut the ticks off with scissors and all sorts of stuff. So it was really difficult. So that 50 year period from um, 1890 to 1945, 50 after the Second World War and the depression to the 1930s. So it was a very difficult period then. Things didn't progress at all because of the financial problems that were there and there was no money at that stage so could, could i characterize it as as farmers were very isolated even within their own uh, farms and and also on top of there being no money is that there wasn't really much of a market so you couldn't produce many animals to generate income to buy fencing when fencing was available and, and, and those kind of things yes you there weren't many people to sell your, your product to. Your communications were poor. You remember there weren't any telephones. The telephones came through here basically in 1955. We, we got our first telephones in the area and, and the roads were, were dirt roads. There were no tar roads. That only came through in the late 50s in any event. So And, and your vehicles weren't as obviously up to date as what they were today. So your communication period, your transportation was exceedingly poor. I mean, you're going into the interland and it wasn't so long ago, you know, and, and I always say stock farming in our particular is actually a loner's job. Nobody knows what you're actually doing because you don't have the amount of people coming to your properties. Today, there is more of obviously communication the last 20, 30, 40 years. But prior to that, it was really a loner's job and nobody really knew what the other next man was doing and uh, what we should actually, what was good for the animal. We had, we used to have uh, state vets that used to come and advise because the mortality rates were so high. And then you had bounty systems for the predators. So it wasn't, it was very difficult. Even as, as a youngster, when I was on the farm, I used to see what was going on with my dad, etc. But I always wanted to farm. That was always my ambition. And when, when, we had, when I was at school, holidays, I always wanted to come to the farm. I never wanted to go and spend my holidays anywhere else. So that is my passion. It's always been. So th that's why I'm still here. And that's why I've got my children here and their grandchildren. They will also come farming one day, hopefully. But we have to do it right over here. And what has been, unfortunately, I can say is that since I started farming in 1963, our, our, our property that we've had has never degenerated it's never been denuded we had the right practices put into place right from those days mm -hmm. and we've just upgraded it into real rotation grazing system a short duration of, of uh, uh, 10 to 21 days and we return if we lightly graze depending on how many animals you put in your flock you lightly graze we come back six months if we uh, that's by taking of 20 30 percent if we take of 60, 70 percent, then we come back 12 months later. So your rotation grazing system that we know today has advanced to that point where I can quite safely say that none of our thicket, as it should be virgin bush filters, we always call it, has not degenerated and hasn't. Uh, 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 the, 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 we, we stopped the rot in 19 in the 1960s. It's it's amazing. It, you know, it's, there's this juxtaposition of concepts that goat farming is terrible for thicket, and yet there's a section of the R75 that runs through your farms, 
uh, and you being one of the biggest goat farmers in the area, and yet you're traveling along the R75 and you don't see fence line contrast. You actually see really, really good looking thicket. And even just driving up to your farmhouse this morning was fantastic. It's not, it's not just biomass, it's not just the amount of thicket that's there, but also just looking around, there was also the, the diversity I'd be used, to, uh, I, I, I'm used to looking at. So there's, you know, you, you prove that it is entirely possible. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating to figure out how you've made that possible. So you've just described a very short duration browsing with very long rest periods. Why, how, how is that working with the vegetation? Can you expand a little bit more on that? It's, it's amazing what we've seen here. And that is that it's taken us, it's taken the Eastern Cape Valley bush for 50 years to be denuded. As I said earlier, it'll take another 50 years to get it right. And we can get it right. Fortunately, there is a, a system that's brought in by you fellows of the Thicket Forum uh, to, to waken this up because it's a, it's a vastly expensive situation to get it back, but it can be done. And uh, I, I don't think we are going to get any departmental assistance in this situation. So financially, uh, the farmer will contribute not only by giving the land that won't be grazed for a period of, say, uh, 10 years, but you'll have to enclose, and it's very important to enclose to keep your game out, to keep your goats out, to keep your small animals out as well. But then the fence can stay there and you can always then open certain gates and you can graze it after 10 years if everything had been brought back to normal. You, you, can, you can seed it and bring in sod bush, etc. And, and other seeds that you can use there, but then you can manage it. Today, you don't need nature to manage your vegetation as it was before man came to the area. Then, then, then you had droughts and you had, bearing in mind now too, that over the last 10 years, we've only had one year that has had above average rainfall. And we, we have our records here since 1950. But the important part is that by introducing your animals into those thickets, or the, those plants that you've planted your speck worm, and uh, then introduce the animals into it, and then you can take them out. So then it's all experimental still at this stage of how you can graze those areas that you are replanting and restoring to similar to what it was in the past, but it can be done. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a fascinating, that's kind of the, the, the next step, but you've got intact Valley Bushveld that you are browsing very successfully to the point where you're, you're expanding your farms. As, as you, you said earlier that you're expanding your farms, but it's not because you're, you're leaving degraded thicket behind you. You're expanding your farms and you, you've got very intact, good thickets on your existing farms. It's not a, a kind of like a scorched earth policy, which is what some, some people might think when they hear, oh, you're expanding your farms because, you, because the thicket is ruined. It's like, no, it's absolutely not. You're expanding it to protect the thicket. So maybe if you could just like run through, so, so you, you, you go for very short duration browsing and very, very long term rest periods, which, is, which isn't exactly the savory method. So maybe if you could explain like, what, what the thinking is go behind that and, and how it differs from like the savory method or the, 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 the ACOX method. Uh, Dr. Armi Okamp, he actually did his doctorate on uh, PhD on spec boom on our property many years ago. And uh, we used to be, he used to come and stay with us when he, he was based in Duny Research Station. And um, then we used to spend many hours talking and discussing how this very bush, bushveld should be uh, utilized. Then what, what and, and he went all over the show within the Eastern Cape and he then spoke about how we should manage this <coughs> Valley Bushfield. And he believed with his experiments that he did that you should, when you utilize it, you can graze it heavily, but for a very short while. 
so that it can rest and then when uh, and it can utilize the rainfall over a year period and then you can come back again and uh, you can graze it accordingly but you must give it a 12 to 18 month rest period so that it can be restored again but you know what we have done now of recent we always had game but game numbers we have increased and unfortunately game you can't manage your game as a rotation grazing system as easily the, the, that the only way you can do that is to have a large area and where you do your, your rainfall never is equal within that large area there's all these other different areas where it, you have more rain or not and that attracts the animals to those particular areas so that's a natural rotational grazing system. Our mountain area over there, which is not Valley Bushville, but Grassville. And there we have roads that we, and, and they are like fire breaks. So we have strips of, of, of burn areas there. But it's, it's very important to have the right carrying capacity and, the, and, and you, you take the, the, the different felt types and you fence those particular fell types off and you graze them accordingly. So you must have the feel of the vegetation. You must see it and you must watch it and don't watch it from a distance. Go and get right in there and have a look and see what is actually taking place. Now, unfortunately, with this heavy drought that we've had, which is normally a three or four year period that you have a dry below average rainfall, but to have nine out of 10 years below average has been a very testing and uh, it's disheartening actually because your veg you, you you your your denuded areas that is now really nothing has recovered from there it's actually deteriorated without any grazing at all in fact so by us increasing the property was basically f so that i can bring the family on the farm number one number two it is then to give more space for our game to move in I was fortunate to be awarded the Southern African Game Rancher of the Year in 2016. So because of the way that we manage our vegetation is one of the main factors. Mm. So how many, how many camps do you have? Because I was looking at your, your map and you've got 41 different farming units that you've put together and many of those are subdivided for camps if i'm understanding it correctly yes we have multiple you know you must imagine that what our watering system looks like too because we send water not only one watering point per per camp our camps the average size of our camps is about 50 60 hectares and so with that there we must have something about 200 camps there you know and then we've got water the water in this particular area, because we've got the blue shale, that's where our farm Blokrans comes in, it's blue shale and that releases so many different minerals, which includes uh, normal table salt. And uh, with the result is that the water that we have underground here is terribly salty. In fact, uh, so much so that I drilled a hole and we put a solar panel in there and we pumped out for our buffalo to wallow and they wouldn't wallow because it burnt their skin so much so that, that's to show you how salty our water is so therefore we had to buy a, pur a purchase property closer to the Vinteruk mountain range where you've got table mountain sandstone and that table mountain sandstone is a very hard rock and it doesn't release any minerals so your your, your fresh water we take from there and we, we have about seven eight systems coming through from those mountains there to the southern to, to the eastern part of the farm on pipelines so we also be around about it must be between a thousand one thousand two hundred kilometers of, of piping all over the show and we also catch water from our roofs of our sheds that to protect our angora goats after shearing and we put that into reservoirs and as another form of, of fresh drinking water so with the amount of camps that we can rotate, you must have facilities. If you don't have facilities and you don't have size, 
then that is the practice that is wanting to have, which is very important to have the correct system for this. And that's what we have proved, that our system has been correct because our felt has, has stayed stable. Our natural vegetation, our thicket area, our virgin felt has stayed stable over the years that I've been farming. So what it requires is, is quite a lot of infrastructure to be able to have those long rest periods, to ensure those long rest periods? You have to have sufficient camp system. You, you have to have a, a group of camps of, say, 10, 10 in, in a group. And then your rotational grazing, you have to have it right managed. That's easy, maneuverable of your animals as well. You obviously have to have your roads in the, in the felt and how you cut up your vegetation, easy to collect because one of our biggest problems that we have in this bush is that when you move so quickly, you've always got goats remaining that are short and, and, and that takes labor, a lot of labor to, to clean all those camps out before you move on again to the others. So we've got groups of different animal types at different areas. You have to get the right animal to the right areas. There's some areas that you can utilize with younger animals and others with older animals. And uh, between our Angora goats and our Boer goats, the more southern areas, we got less, uh, less uh, speckworm area, which are lower rainfall, or areas which has the ra higher rainfall, which is more thornier, we use for our Boer goats. They, they fare better there. And then your uh, lower rainfall area with your more succulents and it, as we term it, sweeter felt and uh, more productive felt is for your younger Angora goats. Mm -hmm. So you have to manage it. You must know your vegetation and that's where your experience comes in as well as advice that you received. We had many information days where years ago that you had with these information days, you had your guest speakers and those with knowledge and Dr. Ami Okamp that um, concentrated mainly on, on the Valley of Bushveld, although he was a Duny research station, which is grass. And then he became the head of pastures in the Department of Agriculture and his offices were in Pretoria. So he was a very knowledgeable man and he's still a, alive today. He lives in Port Elizabeth. He's possibly about my age, resulting in that he could also be a very, uh, it could be very important to, to get his advice mm -hmm. even at this stage. And then Professor Wouter van der Wurfen from Pretoria University, he did work here on, on the game and the vegetation and the amount of energy that the vegetation produces in game through his experiments that he made over here. Mm. So I suppose, you know, if we look at it from the scientific kind of vegetation side of things is that there weren't many people working in, in thicket per se, which meant that only in 1996 was it kind of recognized as something that was unique and should be its own biome and then only mapped after that. And I think pretty much a very similar vacuum of research because Dr. Okamp worked here, but that's only one person, or there've only been there been a handful of people through through the years. Whereas, far more research has happened in the other biomes, and so to understand that we've really been working in a, a vacuum of knowledge, I think, is a crucial thing in terms of moving forward. Uh, in, and and a, again, I, I, I like that phrase of you know, don't don't blame the goat, blame the management, and I. I'd like to ask in terms of the, the the short duration camp system. I mean, it's it's sounds like it requires uh, a lot of infrastructure uh, that needs to go in. It's a it's a it's a big investment. It's it's a, it's a lot of management that's required because you've as you said the difficulties with 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 moving it moving it through. Do you think that there's any other way to do it? I mean, is is if you're going to be working in thicket. We, is we, we need to be able to ensure those long rest periods is the fundamental basis for your, for your farming practice? You or know, you, you, you said the very truth, truthful in the sense that there was very little work or no research done 
until basically the 1960s. So there was, it was a very really neglected area because nobody knew it, nobody wanted to touch it. Until the late 60s, when we got together and said, listen, something has to be done. So what we were doing then is that we were saying what the cutting capacity is and, and the incentives, what the state did by the stock reduction scheme that they brought in to reduce the, the animals during a dry period as well for a three year period and so that they can give the vegetation a chance. But nothing was ever done again after that on restoring the damage that had taken place, mm -hmm. which you fellows with your thicket fordham that you have now and the replanting of speckworm uh, of the last say 10, 15 years that you people have also started experimenting to see if that can take place. Now we've got to the stage where what you've put together and what we have put together as, as landowners and farmers here and that we know what can be done, that we can restore this, the, this vegetation. As I said earlier, it made, it's taken 50 years to, to denude it of certain, certain areas have been denuded. Eh? Yeah. Uh, not, not everything, obviously. But uh, those that have been denuded, I, in fact, yesterday was perched right on top of a, a hill overlooking an area where there were eight different farms, but they were all 230 hectare farms and 300 hectare farms. So, uh, and, and how they had been denuded in the past, which we have purchased subsequently over the years, but we've never been able to restore. We thought that through rotational grazing that the undergrowth would improve. But when you get a severe drought like this, it's like uh, a cement floor. That the, the, the temporary undergrowth has just disappeared. Not because you've been grazed, it's just that your uh, lack of, of, of rain has then killed off the seed's still there because once you're going to get a good rain, the seed's going to come back. But it, it's not sustainable. It's, it's, a, it's a temporary measure on your denuded areas. But if we can get these speck booms put in, and then you put seeds in there of different plants, like as I said earlier on, uh, which is now palatable as well, your salt bush, and, and that's going to be the future. They definitely will. But it must be concerted idea. Incentives must be brought to the fore. And, and, and finance could be found internationally, and, uh, but it must be managed correctly mm. and done. And it's not easy. That's why it has taken so long to get to where we are. But, it, but it's, 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 uh, it, we can make this vegetation sustainable again and back if it's managed thereafter properly. Mm. So you bring up management up being an absolutely crucial component here. And I want to kind of bring in a, a slightly different angle because we've been talking about stock farming. But there, a lot of thicket is now transitioning away from stock farming to wildlife ranching. So do you see, do you see the, there being a juxtaposition? Because you said earlier that wildlife is just really a lot more difficult to manage. So how do we how do we take wildlife, the wildlife ranching, and, uh, and, and how do we manage that now? Because we won't be able to do the f small 50 hectares, 100 hectare camps with short duration grazing. What, what are your thoughts around that? Yes, th that's actually a sore point. And, and that was discussed many years ago too, when, when game farming started and becoming more popular. It's number game. That's at the end of the day, it's numbers. It's very important. It's the unfortunate part is that you can't herd them into a crawl and go through their teeth and see how old they are is what we do with our management of our goats. We go, th we, we check their teeth and when they're older, when they start aging, not when they're too old, when they start aging, we then sell them off. Now the gamer can't do that. But what you can do is you can do an estimation of what your numbers are and then you reduce your numbers accordingly. Bearing in mind it's easy to say take the numbers off when it's dry and then bring them back in again. You must always remember when it's dry there's the excess animals that you are trying to take off. The prices that are down because everybody's doing it and then when you want when it's at good range again and you want to buy the animals in then there's a big demand and the prices are higher. 
So, uh, uh, and, and then also, when you start doing that, it takes years. It'll take you four, five, six years, depending on what type of animal you're talking about. The smaller the animal, the quicker the turnaround. Is that it's, it takes time to get your numbers back into where it should be, to your carrying capacity. However, when you start t talking about that, that again, by the time you've got your numbers back again, the droughts come through here every seven, eight years. You know, you get, they always talk about seven good years and seven bad years, average wise. So it's, it's not an easy form of a livelihood, not an easy form of farming. And, and farming is, is very stressful and is very enjoyable as well on two different sides. If you had plenty of rain and good rains, your work is less and it's a pleasure. And, and, but then, of course, you've got, like all forms of life, most probably, you've got your bad years, your, but when you get lengthy ones, it's not so easy. Mm. And that's most probably why we have been able to buy a property is because there's a risk factor attached to it and the morale of many people drop and that's why they sell. And uh, they're not prepared to work so much harder and diffi more under difficult conditions. And then they sell. Being the smaller properties, they get higher prices. And you'll never get the best return of that small property, but it adds on to your property and your, your, your properties of the past that you've had and that you have will pay for those. So collectively, you increase accordingly. So, okay, like in, in, in summary, for at least for domestic livestock farming, your know, size is absolutely crucial. For, if you're too small, you, you can't afford the rest periods, in which case the thicket is going to go backwards. So you need to have a, have a large size. And then you were mentioning earlier in terms of game that you do have sections that are, that are spread across a wide gradient of uh, well, it's a wide gradient, so if it rains in one area, the game shifts there. So it kind of does a, a natural shifting of utilization. However, I'd imagine that your numbers would have to be quite surprisingly low for that shift to happen, that you don't, because if your numbers kind of spiral upwards, that there the, the, the could be utilization across even the drier parts. I, I suppose what I'm saying is that I'm a bit concerned about one of the things that you've suggested is that for herbivore management, we need to go smaller and more controlled. And yet there's the opposite is what's, is what's happening was where many farms are being bought up. Fences are being dropped. Water holes are still being maintained. Uh, and we, we're getting uh, game animals, uh, wildlife ranching happening. I'm just, you know, is there, is there a concern and something that we need to be looking out for and, and not to make the same mistakes. We should be learning from history of like what happened in the 1900s up to the 1950s of having too many animals on an area. I'm not sure. Yeah. What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Why do we farm? We farm for various reasons, but mainly is because it's your business. Yeah. So therefore you are not keen to allow, remember your game, will die off during a severe drought. So that will reduce numbers there. But you don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. You want to harvest those animals before you get to a situation like that because you want a, re a financial return from them. Yeah. You don't want them just to, to go and die off. It means that... Uh, but it's, it's not easy in this thicket to be able to manage and to be able to count those animals. Mm -hmm. However, what we are doing at the moment is that we are with the South African hunters we are, are hunting the, the female animals that are not taken by your international hunters. Well, there are some international, you know, you've got international hunters and you've got South African hunters. We don't like to use the word biltong hunters and trophy hunters because that's not necessarily the case. There are many South Africans that hunt adult males and there are many international hunters that hunt females. So it's, we, we term it South African hunters and international hunters. And the, the difference is that mainly the South African hunters, they will go for short duration and they are prepared to take out your female animals. And, and we get a better return, obviously, from that. So we try and it's, it's better to overshoot or over-reduce your animals 
than under reducing them because of the damage to the vegetation or the animals dying on you. So, but it's, it's, it's not so easy. It, the, you, you'll never be 100% on that, but that is the direction that we have been going for quite a few years. We've captured many females and sold them. That's when the demand was there. At the moment, there isn't a big demand and it's difficult to, to, to capture in this bush felt in any event with a helicopter, etc. So those are the different options that we have, but it's, it's not an easy option because if you have an open felt completely like a grass felt with a karoo, the rounding up of the animals with the helicopter, nets, etc. and transporting them away, in no time it gets done. The, the professionals that can do it, they do it exceptionally well actually. So we, we have to work it on a different setup over here. We try and capture, but it's not successful financially for the helicopter man as well as ourselves because they pay us per animal so if they can't catch enough animals then they're not doing it financially successful so that's why we have a hassle there the south african hunters they are keen to come unfortunately last year with the covid they weren't allowed to travel so uh, we had a, had a hassle and then we still had the, the dry period that went with it so we reduced ourselves but this year we've had quite a few South African hunters come in the late last year. And uh, that's the way we have to control the numbers. It's, it's, it's a number game, this whole lot. Mm. And it's very important to make sure that you are on the top of your game all the time. Mm. So, so Arthur, it's fascinating to chat to you because you've got feet in both realms. You're not just a domestic livestock farmer. You, you're also involved with the game ranch management. And the one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking now was this whole decade of restoration and we're trying to kickstart this restoration of thicket. You said it's quite possible to do it with the short duration grazing with goat farming. What are your thoughts about how we could go about doing it or should we be doing it with, with wildlife ranching because the, 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 we've got less control, should I say? Well, th this is where the important part is, whatever area you have restored, you should high fence it so you can keep your game out and you can bring them and you can open your gates and that will, uh, that will encourage them to come in into that particular area and graze. And then once you've seen that they have been, uh, they've graved to a certain point where you need to rest that particular area again for say 12 months or whatever, depending on what percentage of your of, of, of your vegetation that you had already taken off within that enclosed area and you're talking about areas now about 50 to, to 100 hectares most probably that, that we can restore with gates and you open the gates allow the animals to come and graze in there and then uh, if you feel they've had enough then you let the animals out again you try you don't enclose them in small areas but allow them to come in and out because it's very important for an animal to have all different types of vegetation because they all have different minerals. So with those different minerals is the growth and, and the productive values of the animal. So you need to have that. So it will, they'll encourage to come into these open areas where you've got the vegetation, which is, which is a temporary vegetation, that undergrowth. It has a certain type of, of minerals that they require, uh, we had experiment done by my neighbor quite a few years ago, we enclosed an area for kudu that just where the kudu hide or stay during the day. And then he found that these kudu were, became smaller and lighter. And then he, he took that away and he gave them this open area to feed on as well and the enclosed thicket. And then they came back to normal and they increased in size again, mm. but pending on numbers again. So they, they need a variety of vegetation. Uh, and so in, in, in the future, is from the game point of view, is that you can, these restored areas, you can manage it. But to manage it, you have to have high fence to have them in and out. So if you don't want them in there, then you can rest that area. Otherwise they can go and denude it because it'll be lush vegetation in there and, and, and fresh vegetation, which would then be very palatable for them. So that would encourage them to come in there. So 
but you can still make use of it in due course to make it mm. to to utilize it correctly number one and make it sustainable would you would you think it's it's it is more difficult with the game ranching side of things and just comparing it oh with, yes with, with oh, 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 very much so but as i said earlier yeah. it's it, it's a game number exercise yeah so you it's up to you as a manager and owner of that property and managing it at this particular period to keep make sure that you keep your numbers down mm. and as i said earlier it's rather reduce your numbers to a lower amount than necessary you can always build it up later again mm. but i've always said to my to my sons i said let's over reduce than than to under reduce because then that's obviously denuding which you're wanting to uh, protect so does the game just kind of a last question about the wildlife ranching I, I think that that cycle that you talk about where there's an abundance of animals on the market because everyone's selling because it's a drought and then when you're trying to restock there's uh, you've, got, you've got an issue because now everyone wants to restock and given that we do go through these cycles often which are very unpredictable I mean it looks like we're heading for a drought and then it, it doesn't if you look at the if you look at the records it's, it's very difficult to kind of Put yourself at any point in that historical record on the eastern cape and then the climate and then predict what the next five years would have been like and so does that apply to uh kind of the the domestic livestock farming taking off and putting on is it is it more adaptable is it easier you see we have angora goats here and the angora goats the the numbers have, have, have dropped dramatically over the years due to the fluctuation in prices. So with the result is that where we find the Angora goat today that you want to sell to is in this dry period. That's why Port Elizabeth hasn't got any water. The catchment area is where the Angora goats are running at the moment. And there has been a, a drought for 10 years. The result is that there's been no water from the catchment area into the dams that, that feed Port Elizabeth barring what they are getting from the Sunday River area and uh, the, the Gharib, etc. But, so, with the result is that if you want to sell off, where are you selling it to? Because the area where we're selling it to is a drought area. So you can't go and sell it to there and then go and buy from there just after the rain because that's not where you're going to get it. So that's a difficult one. Your, your, your uh, boar goats, they are widely spread throughout the country, but... The, the main breeding area is the Eastern Cape anyway, because we've got the right type of vegetation. We must remember that if we want to farm in this particular area, there are certain areas where the bushveld is where we are now. There's no grass, so you don't have grass. You don't farm grazers on browser felt, on dense bushveld. So you have to have browsers into the dense bushveld. So from a game point of view, the whole country isn't uh, isn't drought. In, at the moment, actually, it's only the Eastern Cape over here. Mm -hmm. The Western Cape has had a lot of rain. The the southern part of the Western Cape, and then east of the Eastern Cape, has had a lot of rain. KwaZulu Natal and and the northern part of the country, they've had good rains. It's just our strip over here. So we can always go and buy animals there, but you have to bring browsers into browser. We've got mountain felt that has grass. Uh, we've got roads up there which we act as as fire breaks and then we burn that and that's how your rotation grazing system is much easier on grass field because your systems that you your your strips that you are burning will attract the animals and the rest the other until that has grown out that within five to six years you can burn again because that becomes unpalatable so you have to burn it to make it palatable and productive so that's easier to manage we in fact can to do it within the next two weeks we're going to burn another strip which we do on an annual basis up there we've got seven different strips so we burn one strip a year and that's your rotation grazing system on grass field but this bush field obviously we can't burn i mean that's yeah, unacceptable burn. really it won't burn anyway uh, because it's an evergreen but uh, we have to work other ways and means for our rotation grazing which we have to do with our fencing but as i say it's so dense to get all your animals out there it's it's it's, it's quite a nightmare but it works otherwise i wouldn't be i wouldn't have been farming here for a 60 years 58 60 years and uh, i enjoyed it. it's a good challenge mm. 
and my family there, they all, my, all my two sons and my son-in-law, they're all involved, my daughter's involved, and the whole family is lovely to have everybody around. So, I mean, in, in short, there's no kind of silver bullet farming here. You know, there's not one, one kind of recipe to make a success for, for, the, for, for the Valley Thicket, that we need to be kind of ever conscious of kind of the vicissitudes of, uh, and vacillations of the climate. Yeah, you're right. You know, you have to have the various facilities within that bush. In other words, you have to have your fencing, as I said, your watering points, as I said, your crawls so that you can work the animals and manage the animals, your dipping tanks, your races, and then you have to have your sheds for just after you've shorn your animals for six weeks after shearing, you have to have sheds available so that you can move and, and place the sheds in the right place. If you build the sheds in the wrong place of certain camps, you're never going to get them there when you have to get them in there. So it's, it's very important. Fortunately, with YR today, we can see well in advance what the weather's going to do. When I started farming, we used to listen to the weather at lunchtime and then see if we have to collect that evening or not. But then you always have your sheds up in the southwestern corner because that's where your cold, your rains come from your winds come from, uh, is the southwestern corner and, and the highest peaks. And that's why you had the denuding of the vegetation when it was continual grazing because the animals used to move up to where the animals slept at night and then they used to graze up that direction and then on the way back and in the morning they had to come back on that same route grazing all the way. So your, your overgrazing took place on those southwesterly hilltops in winter and then you get in summer you, in, in, in sorry that that's actually in your cold strips but in winter you have your your uh, your prevailing winds would be your northwesterly so then they would sleep in the northwesterly corner uh, in in winter and, and in summer your prevailing wind is your southwester so then they sleep in the southwest uh, highest peak. <clears throat> so if you have continual grazing, then that is where they denude that vegetation by grazing it every day. If you can take the leaves off a particular plant every day, that root system, the, the, the factory is then taken away because the root system will slowly die. And this is what happens with uh, continual grazing where they move up to Every corner, depending on the wind, they always work upward. Cool. Uh, thank you very much. We've been chatting for a, a, an hour. I think we've had a wide-ranging discussion. It's been very enjoyable. Really appreciate sharing your information and your kind of knowledge of this area. And I'm sure uh, the thicketeers will uh, agree. It's been quite an, an enlightening discussion. Uh, thank you very much for your time. No, it is a pleasure. You know, and I accepted to do what I possibly could is because the more information people have especially from the experience point of view, to, to your, your fellows, your academic fellows, the two must marry and to find consensus. Now, we, we certainly need to be open lines of communication and, and, and engagement and mutual co-learning because academics have very narrow points of view and very both temporally and spatially. And, and so it's always good to have our, our horizons widened uh, and especially by people who have boots on the ground, who've got the experience and, and lived through it. Well, it's part of the communication system, you know, and one must be able to communicate. And that's why the world is, is now a global village. And mm. it's something similar to this, you know, is that we need information coming in and we want to impart information, we want to receive information too. Thank you very much. <coughs>